So the way that Sicilian is used in Sicily is with family and close friends. So it's like the language you joke in. It's the language you know, you, you're intimate with. It's not something you'd use at the bank or the store. That would be ridiculous to do. Uh, I don't think anyone else knows it, but bumazzi. So it comes from the English word, a bum. <laughs> not really nice, but I love how y'all look at this bumazzi. <laughs> There's a big Facebook group. It's called like Cajun Creole, like virtual table. And I posted, I was like, is there anyone out there raising their kid in French or Creole? And a ton of people responded. And someone even shared my post. And they're like, everyone, look, Nick Pinsarello is raising his kid in French. Like, I'm so proud of him. And I was like, because I said, I was like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to raise my kid in our language. And I was like, I didn't tell them it's not French I'm doing, it's Italian. <laughs> Hi, I'm Danielle Romero. Thank you so much for being with me here on my channel where we talk about American identity and family stories. And I have been kind of all over on this channel. We talk about Creole heritage. We talk about Melungeon heritage. We talk about Irish heritage, Italian heritage. We're, we're doing all of it because I have all of this in my family tree. I'm really excited about today's video because it is so unique. It's so unique to me. I'm gonna be talking with a new friend named Nick. He is an American like me. I think he's from Texas and he has Sicilian heritage and he decided he was going to learn Sicilian. I mean like learn Sicilian. He actually talks to his child in just Sicilian at home and his channel is just, first of all, even if you don't wanna learn Sicilian, it's just really relaxing to listen to. I think it's like, you know, those ASMR channels where, you just hear people doing things. Um, I just think it's relaxing to hear. I don't know what he's saying. Na domanda gazendo svisso è e insegnare me italiano prima di studiare o siciliano. And maybe that will change. But I want to talk with him a little bit about the differences between Sicilian, Italian. There's this divide there between these languages and cultures. And I wanted to ask him about his family's story, about coming to the United States, and what it has looked like for him to reconnect. I think for so many of us, even if you don't have Sicilian heritage, Italian heritage, going through the story of how other people have reconnected to their heritage is really powerful, really moving, and it always gets me kind of excited and thinking, I can do that too, I can do more, I can learn more, I can save more. And having someone learn a language that to me seems really difficult and be as proficient as he is at it is inspiring to me. And I hope it inspires you. So I'm really excited to invite him over. Make sure to go give him some love on his YouTube channel. I'll leave a link to it below. And let's welcome Nick onto the show. So I'm Nick Panzarella. I'm a Sicilian Italian American in Houston, Texas. And I am the president of Cadenia Siciliana Foundation. And I am working to promote something called Samana du Siciliano, which is um, a way to promote the usage of the Sicilian language around the world, specifically in Sicily. And uh, most importantly, I'm raising um, a one-year-old kid in Houston with Italian and Sicilian as a non-native speaker. So, um, yeah, that's kind of like the, the, the overview of all the work. And you have a things. great channel. You have a great YouTube channel. Oh, yeah, channel. and I have a YouTube channel. I haven't posted in a little bit because we've been so busy, but I have a channel called uh, Sicilian with Nick where I'm kind of documenting my journey learning. And um, as I find really annoying and complicated things about the language, I'll make an in-depth video that kind of explains um, that aspect of the language for other learners out there. It's so good. And you can do what I do. And I just turn on YouTube subtitles um, and just try to follow along a little bit, even though I have never dipped my toe in it. For some reason, unbeknownst to me, I majored, my undergrad was in Russian literature and language. I have no <laughs> Russian. So I did Russian, I did Latin and Spanish in college, um, forgot all of it. So I don't know, maybe I'll try Sicilian and maybe it will stick. Maybe, yeah, it depends if there's people around you, if there's good content out there, who knows? <laughs> well, okay, so I'm just going to tell you one of the things that comes up a lot uh, when I'm talking to people about researching this side of the family is that Italian and Sicilian, I use it interchangeably. I know that's incorrect, but that's just how it was done in my home. And so I would love to hear what it was like for you growing up, the identification of, of being Sicilian or was it interchangeable with Italian or like what, yeah. what was happening for you? Great question. I think yeah, the, the, the titles are really confusing because everyone uses a lot of different terms. And I actually was just listening to your interview with Charles Marsala. And it's funny to hear him say like, oh, my mom was a Sicilian uh, Italian girl. You know, you're like, comma, 
Um, we're actually a mix. Uh, we're not, I'm not, I'm 50% Italian. And then of that, I'm only a quarter Sicilian. So we actually are truly Italian American. And my dad always made a point of that. Um, so we, because of our last name, our last name is obviously Sicilian. To anyone who speaks Italian, they see that name. It's okay. Sicilian. Um, and I think the way we look is a little more Sicilian. And so, uh, also, and the most importantly, we have really close connections with our third cousins in Sicily. And so for that, we always felt like this is kind of like we're more Sicilian. Everyone in Houston and in the South is Sicilian. Um, so there's not really an Italian community. But my dad always made a point to be like, remember, you're also part Northern Italian. So um, <laughs> we've got family from Genoa around like Liguria area. Um, but I, I do see a lot of it's Italian Americans here who make a huge deal. Like, you know, we're not Italian, we're Sicilian. For us, we're kind of in a unique position in my family that we didn't take that stance. Um, but we do see, you know, recognize the difference, just like we're really proud Texans. Um, you know, we recognize Louisiana, Texas, you know, these are different from New York, New Jersey, um, but everyone's still American. So I, I'm not a big, like, uh, hard line, uh, big separation, but then there's the other issue too, with not just is Italian and Sicilian the same language, um, you know, is one a language, is one a dialect, um, you hear that a lot, but, um, I think it's, it's tough to make that distinction when you're like, oh, my parents spoke, or my grandparents spoke Italian, we'll use that for shorthand, when in reality, most people's grandparents did not even know any Italian, maybe. Right. They just knew their, their regional language. That is, I'm learning so much. I It's embarrassing how ignorant I really was um, to this night. I didn't think to ask my grandparents a lot of the stuff mm. before they passed away. So I again, if anyone's grandparents are alive, like stop watching this and go call them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it, it's... What do they say? It, it's invaluable. Um, I had a question, and I, I don't even really want to ask it, but my grandpa, my dad's dad, he did speak Italian, mm -hmm. um, but now I'm realizing I don't think it was Italian, and I was mm -hmm. I was having a conversation with my mom and dad about this, because I don't remember a thing. I, I just remember a couple phrases he would use, and uh, he always dropped the vowel, at least that's how mm -hmm. it sounded to me, on his words. Is that like a thing that you know about like he wouldn't say mozzarella he'd be like mozzarella or like mm -hmm. prosciutto or like all oh, like i don't even know i can't even do it but is that like a regional thing that you're aware of is that a sicilian like i don't i don't know i would love to start figuring out what he knew yeah so that's it's definitely um it's a regional thing and it's neapolitan okay. um so that's common neapolitan italian they'll often write it as what's called a schwa so it's like a it's kind of like the uh yeah. sound and so there might be like a little bit of a sound like, yeah, mozzarella. It could be uh, or it could just be mozzarella, depending on the accent. It was um, just cut right off. Yeah. No, yeah. So not, there's like one town in Sicily that would do that, but really that's a Neapolitan thing. Um, wow. Kind of two notes on that. I've heard people say Neapolitan was actually the lingua franca for like basically the New York area because all these Italians are coming in, some from the north, a lot from Sicily, ton from Naples. And because it's located in the middle of Italy, it's definitely, it's not really Italian, but it's very, it's closer to Italian than Sicilian or even some of the northern languages. So it's kind of like, all right, none of, you know, maybe you didn't grow up, maybe you didn't go to school in Italy, maybe you didn't learn Italian. So then when you get to New York, you have to communicate with these people from, you know, northern Italy. So what do you speak? Um, you learn Neapolitan. That's so interesting. I'm going to have to look into that. Thank you. I, it was one of those things where I'm not even sure how to Google what the heck I heard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> What, what language drops off, like, final vowel, like, yeah. Um, I've also heard, too, that a lot, of, so this is a situation for me, so my grandmother, she did speak Italian, so she was born in um, Chicago, and she knew some Italian, but I think she had learned it at school, um, wow. maybe, like, Sunday school in America. Yeah. I've heard that, uh, yeah, really strange, um, that there's, like, three things going on. There's, like, yeah, you've got your regional language, um, and then you also have, like, you have to learn English, obviously. But then in the Italian-American community, you're either picking up Neapolitan or if you're writing, everything written is in Italian. So even there's, like, Italian-American newspapers, a lot in New York, all over the country, though. And there's a stigma to write in the regional language. So everyone in uh, America had to learn Italian that were using it if they wanted to, like, use the press or if they wanted to write books or read books in Italian. So... A lot of these immigrants, maybe they went to high school in Italy, and so they learned how to read and write in Italian. Or if they didn't, they get here, and they kind of figure out, like some people call it like a popular or like a, a people's version of Italian. It's not like a super high, like educated version, but it was what they kind of put together on the streets. 
Wow. It, it's so amazing um, how much can almost be lost to, I think, like, we're probably about the same age. And, you know, my great grandparents immigrated from Italy over here. And it's really not that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I already feel like, you know, obviously, they they spoke whatever dialect they spoke came over mm -hmm. here and just kind of didn't get passed down. Yeah. Um, and I've, I wondered about, you know, why that happened. So did you grow up with any Sicilian language, Italian language, dialect in your home? Or is that is this something you have truly pieced together from zero? Um, I'd say from like, Point five, you know, like get a little bit, <laughs> probably as much as you. And I'd like to know, here's some of the word phrases too. But um, you know, I grew up. Um, so our family moved from Chicago. So my grandfather was born in, in Italy. I'd still say I'm at the same distance from Italy as you because he moved here when he was four. So it's really like the great grandparents were the ones who were fully matured, you know, adults that came from Italy. Um, he moved to Chicago, married an Italian American woman, and then they moved to Texas. And so there's actually a pretty decent sized Italian, uh, Sicilian American community here in Houston. But because my family came from Chicago and they moved out to like the suburbs, we didn't intermarry like the rest, like the whole community here. Everyone is like distant cousins. Um, yeah. And they still are intermarrying. Our family was kind of separated. So we grew up like a little bit separate from all that. Um, but we still, you know, used a handful of Sicilian words. I thought they were Italian words, like you were saying. Then I find out like all of them are just Sicilian. Um, <laughs> yeah, none of it Italian. But you know, my grandfather, who was from Sicily, he passed away in '69, so I didn't know him. Mm. But my grandmother still learned a lot of Sicilian from him, and I think in Chicago there's a lot of Sicilians, so she picked up a lot. And so we we used a couple words, mostly like curse words. Um, yeah, oh, a lot. Yes, I didn't know they were swear words. Yeah, so we, it was swear words and food words, and you don't yeah. know as a kid like. Yeah, you're just hearing it. So yeah, what's the difference? <laughs> uh, yeah, and people would be like, "Oh, do you make do you know any Italian?" And it'd be like, "I know like five words," and like, "I don't think I should say any of these in elementary school right now." <laughs> That's so hilarious. Well, I'm so impressed that you are. You're not teaching your child Sicilian. I mean, you are. You're creating a new experience for the next generation of kids. I mean, you are immersed. The child is immersed in this. Tell me, what does that look like? How does that work yeah. in the house? Is your wife? But like what's happening there? This is yeah, uh, it's something it's really I'm excited about for me and like the Italian community, but really like I, I and actually what I really hope for is like I'm learning from the indigenous community and I hope like these folks to run with this. Like, you know, we all need to share these experiences for like reclaiming languages. Um, but so I, there's a book called Bilingual Children by this guy named George Saunders in Australia, and he was a German professor and he had no German heritage. But he said, look, you know, I learned this language. I would like to have German speakers to practice with every day. So I'm going to raise my kids in German. And he documented the whole process. It's a pretty short book. I think it's about like 150 pages. And um, so but, you know, when I learned that my wife was pregnant, we started doing a lot of research. Um, but the idea is speak in the language to the child, um, read to them every day, even from, you know, basically while they're in the womb. And then try to get them uh, native, native content. So you need them to hear the native accent, the native cadence and grammar, things like that. And so we now, this book was written in the 80s. Now we've got like Spotify and all, you know, YouTube, everything. Um, so, you know, from day one, we were playing music while my wife was pregnant, playing music, watching Netflix in Italian and Sicilian. There's not much in Sicilian, but there are, there's actually quite a bit on YouTube um, and a couple of movies too. And then when it was born, I had a book that I printed out. So I, there's a subreddit where these, there's a 17 year old who's very intensely very passionate about the language. He was um, posting like short stories that were, a lot of them were traditional stories like Cinderella that either he was translating or wow. um, taking, you know, old ones that were written in kind of like weird writing systems and making them more yeah. standard. That's awesome. I made, a, I made a collection of it. This, it's called, yeah, this is on Reddit. It's r slash uh, Siciliano, Sicilian with a U at the end. Um, and so I took all this, these things that he was, you know, producing and I put them in like a document, printed it. And at the hospital, you know, day one, my kid was born. I'm like reading these short stories. To him. <laughs> You're like, get over here. <laughs> <laughs> and so we do that whenever I get an opportunity to, to take him to meet someone like, um, I, I do have my Italian citizenship and I'm not sure if that's something you've pursued yet. Um, but I'm now part of, there's um, an elected body that represents the Italian community to the consulate. And so wow. I'm on it now and, you know, they have meetings quarterly. And so 
that's like perfect. Like this is an excuse. I get to take my kid. We listen to the meeting. He walks around. I mean, he's only, you know, like I said, 11 months old, but uh, he's hearing that native content, uh, na you know, native speakers. Whereas I didn't experience, you know, I don't know if I met someone from Italy until I was like 14 years old. So, wow. Um, you're doing a great job, Nick. That's amazing. I'm amazing. You know, it's, I feel kind of guilty hearing this because my, my husband's like side of the family, his grandpa and stuff were native Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. And so early on, we decided, because I felt more comfortable Spanish, that with the kids, they listen to Spanish music, watch Spanish mm -hmm. TV shows, like not a lot, but like we do a little bit of that. We have some Spanish books. We don't like use it, not like really the way you're doing it, but it's just something they are comfortable-ish with. Like they can figure stuff out, but I realized I, I never did that for my side. I always felt, um, I don't know, it's intimidating because I think Spanish is everywhere. Spanish yes. is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And and it's such a different experience. And I think a lot of people could relate if they have, uh, even if they don't have Sicilian or uh, Italian heritage, if you're trying to learn an ancestral language that is not so permeated in the culture, mm -hmm. it's kind of challenging. Can you tell me about some of the more difficult parts of starting this big adventure of, you know, re not just learning Sicilian, but really like reclaiming it. Um, I know a lot of people will say, don't bother learning Sicilian. Don't mm -hmm. bother learning these dialects. Have you heard that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got like a whole video about that because the language is hard to learn because it's not a standardized language and there's not a lot of content online. That's like a big issue. But the biggest issue, I think, is the way people tell you like, oh, don't learn it. Or it's like, it doesn't even matter because every town talks differently. You know, there's, it's so different. Um, there's no such thing as a Sicilian language. It's just dialect. Um, and so I think that is difficult. And there's people online, there's these websites, Preply or Italki, where you can find tutors. And half of the tutors who like say that they teach Sicilian will basically lecture you about why you're wasting your time. And it's like, I'm pay I'm trying to pay you to teach me a language. Um, but that is very frustrating. Um, I will say that one of the when I first started this, uh, there was many times in the first six months when I was thought I should just like drop the Sicilian crap and do and teach my kids Spanish because I said I studied Spanish. I speak it pretty well. In fact, I learned Spanish probably before I learned Italian. And my neighbors from Cuba does not speak English. Um, just in my neighborhood, you know, I'm in Texas, and I think you're in the South now too. But yeah, everywhere in America, Spanish is incredibly useful. Um, if you wanted to immerse your kid, it's yeah, piece of cake. Um, so I think for me, the problem was I didn't have a high level of Sicilian. I thought I did because the languages are similar. Um, you know, I'm not mm -hmm. going to deny it. It's Italian and Sicilian are pretty close. Um, but there's still, I think, really, if you want to speak really good Sicilian, then it gets really divergent. Um, and so for me, I learned Italian, I think at a very high level, I'd studied it abroad. Um, and then when I visit my cousins, they'd speak a lot of Sicilian. So I was like, oh, I, I speak this language really well. Because there's a lot of sound changes. For example, mm -hmm. a double L becomes a double D. So like my last name, Pansarella, Pansarella. And so I was like, oh, great. Like, bello bedu. Okay, easy peasy. Um, but then it gets much more difficult. There's a lot of, like, vocab you have to learn. Like, it's not just a few sound changes. And so, um, you know, we had nine months before my child was born to, like, really, I studied a lot. Um, then when he was born, I'm still not confident in speaking it all the time because I've never had really an opportunity to just speak 100% Sicilian. And here's the hard thing too, like I'm sure maybe you dealt with this with Spanish. You may study a language, but then when you're learning language, you know, on I, I talk or Duolingo or whatever, they're not teaching you, you know, time to change your diaper. Like, oh, hey, come here. Like the phrases that we naturally say as a parent aren't on a list somewhere. And so I felt, yeah, really like... Um, not confident I mean, yeah just like this is dumb uh and so there's a lot of times i was going to give up but it's uh, the way i do it is one day i'll speak italian so i'm only speaking italian the next day i speak sicilian and that's all i speak and so it switches each day so for me it kind of gave me a break because i feel pretty confident with italian um wow. and it gave me time to like you know make lists like oh right, i don't know the word for dandelion you know like let's go look that up um and these kids on reddit have been so helpful because uh if, if i didn't find them there's a lot, you probably joined some of these Facebook groups. I think I've seen you in some of these Sicilian groups. It's a lot of fighting. It's a lot of like, that's not how we say it. Like, all right, like whatever. But um, these guys, they take like a kind of a, um, an academic approach. They say, look, you know, this is a, an Italian derived form. It's okay. People use it now. So it's part of the Sicilian language. Or they might say, actually, this is a real, a more 
true Sicilian word that's still in use in some parts of the island, you should use this word. Um, and so basically, it's good to have some help out there. If I was just out in the cold, um, I don't know if I could have done it. So. Your videos are, I, I, I am just stunned to hear that you have any hesitation of saying that you're, I mean, I'm just so impressed, so amazed. I thought you were a native speaker. I mean, not that I yeah. really, what I say matters because I don't know. <laughs> like, I was just so amazed by it. Um, do you have a favorite, like, this might just be my thing. Uh, I really like, there's a certain words in certain languages that I just mm. really like. I don't know why. Do you have a favorite Sicilian word or phrase? Maybe it has like a special meaning or there's a story behind it. Yeah. So when I first came back from studying abroad too, someone's like, hey, Nick, they asked about Italian. They're like, "Is what's the funniest word you learn in Italian? And I was like, that's a really dumb question. Because like, I, I don't know, it's like hard to say what's a funny word. But instantly I had the word that was a Sicilian word and it's babaluchu. Or babalucci, either way you want to say it. And it means snail. I love it. Yeah, a great word, babalucci. There's so um, many great sounds I feel like I hear you use on the channel. I'm like, I don't know what it's connected to, but it's just such a nice sound. I don't know. Nice. I'm glad you say nice, too, because I think if I were when I was younger, too, I was like, I was like, it sounds like a really ugly, like, I don't like a gross language, but uh, it's got, yeah, it's got, it's a unique language, I think, is. I don't, know. I, is, I don't know. I like it. I think the cadence too, even if, no, I don't know. So my, both my dad's grandparents, sets of grandparents were from Southern Italy. It's just like, I, I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, but I feel like the cadence is familiar. Like there's just a cadence. And even if people were speaking in English, yeah, I think you just kind of can tell the flavor is there. Yeah. I'd love to hear about the experience of getting your Italian citizenship. So I know, so your grandpa was born in there. And I think that that makes that's probably the line that you used i'm assuming that's what we that's were hoping sure we were hoping um because he came here so he was born in italy and then he came here his father so my great-grandfather became an american citizen while he was still a minor and because he was born in italy he just became an american citizen with his father so that line was cut off um so then we looked at my grandmother's side and so her father was born in Italy as well. And um, she was born in America. And that's like the key is she was born in America before her father became naturalized. So basically that means that she was born both in American and in Italian at the same time. Um, it, but then here's the, the, the tricky part is women were not allowed to pass down Italian citizenship until 1948. So I reached out before I knew this. I reached out to all my cousins and I was like, guys, I'm pretty sure I found a route. And it costs us maybe two grand. You have to get all these documents. If anyone wants to like go in with me, I'm like, do this for us. And uh, and then I did a little bit more research. And I was like, guys, I'm sorry. Out of all of you guys, my nuclear family is the only ones eligible because my dad was the last of his four siblings. Uh, so none of my cousins were eligible. Uh, for us, we didn't have to do so. Like, yeah, they call it like the 90, 1948 case means you have to, I think, go to the Supreme Court or pay a lawyer. We did not because my grand, my father was born after 48. And so after 48, women could pass on citizenship, no question. So for us, it was pretty easy, actually. Um, all of my cousins are still eligible as long as they just go through this more complicated process. And I don't think, you know, most of them weren't that interested. And so they'd have to, like, pay for a lawyer. I don't think they'll ever do it. Um, but, yeah, it's crazy, right, that the women couldn't, like, what, like, what kind of goofy laws where only a, a man could pass on citizenship? It's, it's crazy. I, yeah, I was trying to figure it out because I don't know... If we're out, like, I think we might have a more difficult case, um, just because my my great grandpa naturalized before my grandpa was born, but his wife was an Italian citizen, and she just became a citizen because she married him. So, like, I don't know. There's all this weird stuff, but I feel like they want they want people to go through this process. Like, Italy wants people to reconnect. Sicily they wants they want people to reconnect. Um, so, I'm really glad that you did it. How long ago was it that uh, you went through the process? Yeah, 2016 is when I got it, and it took about it took about three years. And it's funny, I, I do think I agree that Italy wants people. I think if they were smart, they would be like, they created a really smooth pipeline to like send people to the south. But um, it's I don't know if it's intentional or what. The hardest part is getting an appointment with the consulate, and that's why it took three years. It wouldn't have taken me three years otherwise, because um, I had all the documents. It was just like we couldn't get an appointment. That's crazy. So have you have you been over since you gotten it? Mm -hmm. Um so 
since I got it, I guess I've been back maybe two, two times, maybe three times, probably just two times. Um, we went in 2021 for my cousin's wedding over there. And um, yeah, just I used the passport. There's a little bit of complication about like when you're supposed to pull it out or not. And generally the rules like while you're in America, use American. While you're in Europe, use the, it's Italian. Mm. The sad thing is you don't get the stamps on your passport. <laughs> No, you know, really? It was like, you know, my brother's like, I have this brand new passport. He has a, like a new American one too. And he's like, there's no stamps. I traveled you know, to Europe. I got nothing. Because <laughs> um, so. oh, they can just use the EU passport and you don't. Yeah, once you use that, they're just like, and you go to all the 28 countries and there's no stamping because you're like essentially home. That's amazing. Uh, tell me, what did it feel like going for the first time? With the citizenship? Just going to, just, I mean, I mean, I, I guess I, I say going back, going back, not home, I guess, but like where your family was from. I mean, so is it the first time you were going over there? Um, I don't know, I'm just because I haven't, I haven't been to Italy yet. I haven't been to really. Sicily. My brother has. He went and stayed with family. Um, but I, I want to watch that video too. I saw that you've got that. Um, yeah, it's funny. You've gone, you've gone all this way to uh, uh, northern Louisiana to visit Sam, but not Italy yet. Um, <laughs> uh okay so we went the first time i got to see my cousins was when i was like about 14 years old and it was kind of a magical experience because like we we're not really that like different from anyone here you know we did a couple things that were like italian we just knew like my grandma's italian that she spoke you know she spoke italian and genovese um but like go away it being told like all right we're sicilian we're sicilian and then we get to go there and we're like ah we're here um it was kind of magical i don't know if you've seen white lotus have you seen the, the sicily season of white lotus it's great you ought to see it because it really deals with this um this idea of italian americans calling themselves like, oh we're sicilian and then we're in sicily and it's like you guys are not you know we're not the same um well we were actually kind of a, a little story about that there was a point when we were saying goodbye to our cousins and they were like hey i'll you know everyone let's get take a picture and they're like okay now just the sicilians and we had some family friends with us. So I was like, oh, it means us and my cousins, but not the family friends. And they were like, no, Nick, like, you're the Americans. Like, I meant just the Sicilians. Like, I was like, oh, I guess we're not the same. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I feel so burned, dearie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, it is, I don't know, there's something about it. Like, you know, Jewish people get, like, birthright. And we kind of used to joke that this is our, like, you know, birthright. Me and my, my brothers when we go back. Because, I don't know, there's something special about it. And my dad always says, like, he's from this little town north of Houston. He's like, there's two places that feel like home to me. Like, this little town and our little town in Sicily. And he's like, I haven't even spent a lot of time, that time there. But he's like, every time I'm there, like, something about it feels like home. Um, so, yeah, it's a little place, 3,000 people. And I don't know if it's home or what, but it does, I do feel like a special connection there. And I hope they don't think I'm crazy for thinking that me and third generation, you know, so distantly related. But when I was there, people would stop me and say, like, like you look like someone from this town, um, which was, like, super special. Yeah. And, oh, that's my dream. I, yeah. I, I feel like I usually have people saying that to me. I'm like, yeah, I have no connection to you or your culture. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's, that's so beautiful. Okay. Well, I have to ask you this um, because I kind of, I'm a little bit of an idealist. I put the cart before the horse. I was looking at the one year our houses. That oh, yeah. they're, not really gonna be, they're not really going to be a euro, I know. But is this something you have thought about doing, grabbing something over there and spending time there like that? Or is that, is not, does that not tempt you? Because it really tempts me and I don't even know the area. <laughs> it's definitely tempting. We, I, my family always sends it like our group text or group chat every now and then. We, me and my wife almost moved. So before the baby was born, we were like, you know, I've got the citizenship. Let's do this. Um, we were going to move because I had a remote job that had a branch in Europe at the time. So we bought a plane ticket. We were talking to a realtor. We we're going to move to Palermo and like raise this kid there. Um, not a Euro house. We we're just going to be in like the city. Uh, and so we were really like ready to do that. I'm so glad we did not leave before having a baby because my parents live like five minutes from here. And if we were in a foreign country without the grandparents, like it would have been so hard. Um, but the Euro thing, I think to do like summers over there i think it's really intriguing we're actually going to go this september to go spend a time a uh, week in palermo in a week in my family's town and uh, really just for the language it's kind of like we're saying it's like a study abroad like what the kid right. to um i think it would be great yeah i think yeah if, the question is have i ever thought about like buying a place over there and spending some time on so yeah, me and my brother is always <laughs> um so who knows if we'll do it 
it's tough to say too is it like really worth buying a place how often will you be there um i know maybe, maybe it's better but it, there's like something psychological i think about being like ah, i bought a place in my family's town i don't know or yeah, they like a, yeah I, I agree i mean to be in the town would be incredible to to really home in on that but i think just keeping that connection there and it feels much more permanent that way um i don't know i think again you have to be a little bit crazy to want to do it, which I definitely am. <laughs> but you're right. Um, my husband's parents, I got them to buy a house literally 30 seconds away from ours. And I don't know what I would do without them. Um, so that has stifled it a little bit because yeah. of, <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, you'll have some beautiful views, but you can't go out without the kids. So you don't, you can't do that much. Um, I would love to talk um, just in closing. So you said that this week coming up, is a really special week for Sicilian language preservation. I'd love to hear a little bit about what that is. Um, yeah. It was the first time I'd ever heard of it. Yeah, so just real quick before we get into that, Sicilian, like all these languages of Italy, there's maybe, I think some people say there's 33 different languages in Italy. Um, it's at risk. It's at risk because since Italy became a country in the 1860s, um, you know, there's been this process of standardization. They're trying to build one nation, one language. Um, but people in Italy didn't always speak the same language. And so this last generation, I think, is probably the one who learned Italian the best. And they wanted to remove that stigma of speaking what they consider like an underclass dialect. And so a lot of parents, especially middle and upper class parents, refuse to speak the language to their children. I think when people say that, too, they're not always as good as they think they are. They say, oh, we don't speak Sicilian at home. But the children still are absorbing quite a bit. But every generation that does that is basically diminishing the skills of the language. We're losing vocab, we're losing grammar. Um, and some people now, for the first time, just don't even understand Sicilian in Sicily. Um, Sicily is in a good place. I think about probably 80 to 90 percent of the people there understand the language. Probably about 60 to 70 percent speak it at a high level. Um, a high level is hard to say because even people who speak it very fluently, um, they never have to take a test in it. They never read it. They never write it. There's all these things where um, it's not something that they're confident in using. And so what we're trying to do is change people's perceptions of the language, but also change their habits with the language. So Sicilian Week is something that a group of Sicilians and I started. And um, it's uh, this year, it's March 31st through April 7th. And the idea is to encourage everyone to use the language in new contexts. So the way that Sicilian is used in Sicily is with family and close friends. So it's like the language you joke in. It's the language you know, you, you're intimate with. It's not something you'd use at the bank or the store. That would be ridiculous to do. And it's not something you write. And that's just, you know, um, languages like Basque or Catalan or even Welsh uh, in Europe, if you go back 60, 70 years, it would have been the exact same situation that they would have thought that was absurd to write in these languages. Um, but with you know changing attitudes, they made these languages official. They put them in schools. Now universities are taught in Welsh. Um, they've got the, the full 180 on how these languages are perceived. And so what we're trying to do is start by you know starting with the people, encouraging them to use the language in more places, encouraging them to study the language, and encouraging them to create things in the language. Because we need new books, we need children's books. Um, you know we have I think less than 10 children's books in Sicilian. Uh, my wife and I were working on one right now. And so, um, you know, we're trying to encourage people to use the language. What can we in the diaspora do, though? Essentially, you know, we can't speak it every day because we're not in Sicilian communities necessarily, but we can study the language and we can promote it to our family and our cousins and say, hey, you know, I care about Sicilian while I'm in America. You should care about it too in Sicily. I hope you know about this thing. Um, and then, you know, we can create things too. I've got a, a Sicilian comedy, like a little play I wrote um, that I'm, you know, it's full of mistakes. I still need to edit it with some Sicilians, but these are things that, you know, we're trying to, to gather, create, and share so that we've got a, a firmer base for the language going forward in the next 10 years. Because the hope is, and this is like the, the dream, is that Sicilian will be a, a co-official language with Italian. So we're not anti-Italian. You know, we, we recognize it's a beautiful language. It's part of our culture. It's been around for 500 years, um, you know, in Italy and in Sicily. But um, Sicilian also needs its place at the table. and It needs opportunities to be used in official settings and not just for jokes. The jokes are great, but, you know, we need more. We need more. We need to get your son on here. Let's say like five years. Let's come five back years. and <laughs> see what he has to say, because I would love to see the progress. I'm so glad you're doing the children's book. I can't believe there's only... 
Yeah, it's just amazing because there's so many of these languages that are at risk around the world, even here in the U.S., you know, mm -hmm. and I feel like um, I would have never thought Sicilian was in that same category. I don't know. I wouldn't have even thought there was an issue. So I'm, I'm kind of shocked to hear that. So I hope that especially like folks in the audience who know they have Sicilian heritage or roots uh, to just know, like, Whatever you have to bring to the table sounds like it will be welcome and, and well received because it's going to take, you know, a bigger community this time yeah, to kind of do that. I know. I want to give a shout out to for organization Academia Siciliana. What they're trying to do is create a standard. Well, they've already created it. It's a standard orthography. So um, we talked earlier about every different town kind of has a different way of talking. Um, but Sicilian is all essentially... It's very comprehensible, even though they sound a little bit different. Some people say "biedu," some people say "bad do," some people say "bello," but we can all understand each other. We need a simple way of writing the language that people are confident in using. And so what they've done is they've created this standard Sicilian writing system. We're trying to encourage more people to use it. We're, this organization is helping create more of these children's books. And the fingers crossed, this is the, the, the other part of this dream is to create a Sicilian language school, kind of like a kindergarten in Sicilian. Um, within the next you know, two to three years here. And once we kind of have that, that's a model that can be replicated. So if anyone's interested in learning more, Academia Siciliana, um, I think it's .com. Let me double check before I... People are like, I'm, I'm excited. I want to help. And it's like, but what do you do? Yeah. yeah. So that we'll would be, be raising good. funds eventually. I, know the, I think the biggest thing that I think us as like Americans we can do is help fund the work that's happening there. Um, because yeah, I can raise my kid here with the language but if he's alone in America without it, you know, it's like we need that that base that, you know, Sicily is where the language lives and dies. And so we need to be able to support events, schools, you know, organizing that's happening there. Um, but then also preserve our you know, special words, too. We didn't even talk about the Sicilian American words that are you know unique to our communities. Um, and so there's all things we can all share. Ooh, can, you, can you tell me some so I can yeah, have a yeah, lot quick. to have? I'm taking notes on everything, but I'm going to turn... I've got a little uh, white square. Next time you go to Louisiana, you have to visit Independence, Louisiana, which I think Charles maybe spoke to you about, but it's a, I think it's 90% or 99% Sicilian. It's right outside of New Orleans, uh, or wild. north of it. Uh, and so they, yeah, they all use this word, but all in the South, we know this word. It's Bacausa. Uh, I bet they even use it in New York. It's back when we used to have outhouses. So in Sicilian, it would be Casa d'Age, Casa d'Arre. The, 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 the back house and so we use English back house back house, uh, um, <laughs> super common that's like it's like that's one of the words like everyone knows um, and then another one this one we would use uh, I don't think anyone else knows it but bumazzi so it comes from the English word a bum <laughs> so there's like a homeless guy it's like not really nice but I love like, all the <laughs> look at this bumazzi <laughs> I heard um, my grandpa would call people stew nods, and then he would uh, he would be like ah, maroon, like I don't know whatever he was saying. I think it just means like damn it. Um, and he also used other ones that I won't use on here because I always get in trouble with YouTube, and I don't need another flood video. But it was always a very like <laughs> punctuating whatever's going on. Um, that is so the Neapolitan fun. family. I'm not sure if you've identified it yet, but there's there's definitely some Neapolitan in there. <laughs> No, well, there should, I mean, huh? they, I know they, no, I mean, there, there is, I'm saying like, I don't know, I don't know all of the, everything, but I know they did live in Naples okay. for a while. And, um, I think they were from kind of, kind of maybe South of Naples, but they're like in that, in that area. But I, I think I, I don't know if I had mentioned this or not, but I was always confused because my dad would say they were Southern Italian, but then he would also tell me, well, we're Sicilian. I remember thinking, but I can't find any connection like to the island. And I just learned with that conversation with Charles, I literally, I did not know this, about the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Mm -hmm. It was like angling down over Naples, like, you know, mm -hmm. so Naples is included. And so there's this idea of we're looking at, I'm looking at the map in 2024 and saying, well, that's not Sicily. And there's this mm -hmm. sense of, I, it's the sense of identification and things were just totally different than anything I, I knew. And so I guess they really could have been living in Naples area and still see themselves as Sicilian. I mean, I don't know. So I'm still trying to figure that out. But Naples is definitely, you know, I, would, like, I don't, castle. yeah, I mean, and, you know, there's so many beautiful uh, languages and dialects that I want to make sure I have the right ones before I start learning one that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, I'm close, but that's the wrong village you're learning. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, but this is amazing. 
So I gave this presentation about reclaiming the language um, and you know, raising your children with it. And I, I used your video about um, why, do, you know, why do Italians not speak their languages? Um, and one of the things, too, I made a note, though, in my speech was um, we need to make sure we know which language, because a lot of them weren't speaking Italian originally when they came here. And there's even in the southern Italy, there's parts of uh, Calabria that speak Greek still. Um, there's parts that speak Albanian languages called Arboresh. And so some people might think, you know, oh, I, I'm Sicilian, I must speak Sicilian. And then they look back and it's like, actually, your family's been speaking Albanian in Sicily for 500 years. Um, so there's all these complicated things that you need to... Yeah. That's a great point, which language. And I honestly, when I made that video, I didn't even, like, and it's so good, like, talking to people who are studying these things and you realize how much you have to learn and now I can make adjustments and while well, I'm reconnecting and stuff. Because you're right, I just assumed it was Italian, and um, and like my brother said, like he learned Italian to go over there, and then he met the family, and they didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> and that's why I started learning the language too. Was like because I learned all this, I spent so much time learning Italian, exact same story, and I get there, and I'm like, I can't understand anything. And even even here in Houston or in Texas, I did. I went to Dallas for a, a baptism of my goddaughter and my cousins, and um, there was these two guys standing outside the church with little Italian pins. And I was like, oh, do you guys speak Italian? I said, I think in Italian, I was like, oh, like, part of the Italiano. And he started speaking to me in Sicilian. And he goes, oh, like, certo, capaz, Italiano. And I was like, dude, you're not speaking any Italian right now. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's how it was, right? Like, people, it's, it's all Italian, you know? It's, yeah. That's, that's amazing. I am. Um... Boy, it just is so, it, there's just, I have so many questions, but I want, I think maybe we can do a second video because I'll, I'll love to see um, maybe questions people have for you. Because I think even if this is not part of their heritage, just this process of reconnecting is, it crosses all of those lines of language and culture. And I think just as Americans, um, I know I'm, I'm proud to be American. I'm sure you are too, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I feel just uh, a sense of, there's something that I want to preserve. I don't want it to die with me. You know, I don't want to be the one that let it, the you know, let it drop. Um, and I think a lot of us feel that way. So I feel like you're such a great example of someone who like, you really did it. And I, I'm really like props to you, like amazing, amazing work. I'm so thankful for just you being someone in that space who actually, who actually did that. Um, this well, is really cool. That. And, and <laughs> yeah. I want people to know too, that they don't have to be extreme. I like to say there's like not speaking the language at all and then learning it and raising it and only speaking it at home with your child. And that's like the extreme end. So it's like, there's a whole spectrum, like using some phrases, learning a couple of like nursery rhymes. Like there's no like small steps we can do in the middle. And yeah, if someone wants to go the crazy route, like the crazy route's there for you. Um, I love it. And, and I've seen, I'm always like looking on YouTube for people doing the same thing. I've seen some people, I think it's, um, maybe Cree. There's a few indigenous languages where it's like, oh, I, like I, I want to see more families with all like Irish, everything like that. I think the Irish parents have been kind of like on the extreme edge, and so I think the more content that's out there in the world, the more people might realize like I can do this too. Um, and and I might have to point you in the direction of some Louisiana French people because I'm not sure if you've seen the Creole revival. I don't know if you have many contacts with Creole language people. Um, a little bit. I uh, So my mom's grandmother, that was her first language, but we didn't realize it until after she passed away. Um, so I, I have thought about that too. And this is the other part, I think, about being an American. Is this like, if I want to learn my like family languages, it's like, well, which one? Exactly. Which, like, six? <laughs> um, that would be great, though. I would, anybody that you know, I would love to get connected to for sure. I'll send me because my grandmother, my mom is not a time, but my grandmother grew up speaking French in Louisiana. And so for me too, it was another like, you know, I studied French. I'm not as like into the community, but I follow, I, I, what do you call it? I lurk. I like watch what's happening and they're doing a lot of good work. And there's people out there. I, this is kind of a funny story too. There's a big Facebook group. It's called like Cajun Creole, like virtual table. And I posted, I was like, is there anyone out there raising their kid in French or Creole? And a ton of people responded, and someone even shared my post, and they're like, everyone, look, Nick Panzarella is raising his kid in French, like, I'm so proud of him, and I was like, because I said, I was like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to raise my kid in our language, and I was like, I didn't tell them it's not French I'm doing, it's Italian, <laughs> but, but then there was, there was a lot of good responses, because there's a lot of people that, like, even posted videos, and they're like, this is my kid, I've never spoken English to them, like, this is a person in Louisiana, they're like, and here's a picture of me, like, reading a French book to them, and so it's like, 
these crazy people are out there. They're doing it. They're doing it for French. They're doing it for Creole. Um, Creole, we want to talk about no kids books. There was like, I think one Creole kids book and it was made last month. So what? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it just didn't exist, right? Like, there's there's a bunch of newspaper articles from the past. That, it, was, it, was, it was the language of the community, but it wasn't like there was publishing houses doing a lot of the stuff. Right. I could be wrong. I hope someone steps in and says, Nick, you're full of crap. But now they're having to kind of restart from step one. Um, and I, I'm personally trying to learn from everyone, and I hope everyone, too, is like, you know, what are the Catalans doing? What are the, you know, Ojibwe people doing? What are the Creoles doing? Um, and trying That's to, like, awesome. you know. Yeah. Make it all happen. I love it. Or you can do it my way where the kids, I'll just be like, go get your Rojo shoes. Because <laughs> like, I like, that's where we've got. And I feel a little inspired because the kids, they absorb it. Um, you know, when, when they watch, they have it. It's like a, it's like a Sesame Street for mm -hmm. kids and it's in Spanish. And I'll put it on sometimes. Like if I am, you know, making something, I'm like, you can watch this while I'm making dinner or whatever. And they absorb it and they're laughing and there's no English. And it's just amazing how quickly they can pick it up. So like, maybe they can teach me, you know, if it's a little too late, yeah. I feel like for me to still um, surround your kids with the language so they can at least feel familiar. And maybe who knows, like, you know, when they grow up, maybe they'll feel like it's something they want to pursue, which would still be awesome, which would be awesome. I think that yeah. is a good point. I, 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 I say people like, did you ever have a, a one Italian kids book or anything in Italian, like written in it growing up? Like I didn't, and so I think just having a little bit of that content around it, you know, that's your identity, and that's proof that, like, you know, it's it's part of who you are. That physical aspect of your culture, you know, um. So I think any little bit counts because yeah, you and me, we grew up with you know a dozen words of Italian or whatever it was. Um. So anything additional, I think, is a good base because we can all go like we can take Spanish in high school. We can take it to college when we want to. Um. But, you know, anything we can give them now is a gift. They didn't ask for it. They didn't need it. But we, we gave what we could. That's right. Um, and later on, I think, uh, you know, you don't, you don't realize how valuable stuff is, I think, in, until you're older, which I sound like such an old person saying that. And I am. And get off my yard. <laughs> That's how I feel now. <laughs> but but it's, it's true. So thank you, Nick. I have um, more questions, which is great. I feel like I'm, like, kind of inspired to look into some stuff. So I'll probably want to ask you to do this again rant which is basically like you can reclaim your heritage language for yourself and for your kids and for your family if, if you really want it i think we're in the golden age of language learning even if you're for a really under-resourced language we've got facebook and twitter things like that we just you never would have been able to reconnect with people and it's awesome to see you, you pop up in like these you know bizarre facebook groups that i'm in and it's like oh there's danielle like in the you know the yeah, louisiana group or the, the italian group um yeah. We're, we're rebuilding like i mean i didn't even know like charles my solid like a year ago i didn't know about his stuff and now i'm like i need to be connected with him and so you're kind of laying a groundwork for italian americans for creole americans like people are awesome. well we're so right? connected yeah. like we're just our communities are connected like you're saying the sicilians in new orleans i'm like really it's awesome. It's so awesome. And I'm I'm excited. I don't know if there's any Sicilian language in my family story. I'm going to call my dad when I get off the phone and just be like, tell me everything, Grandpa, <laughs> and find out and report back. But um, it is so awesome. At the end. Yeah, instead of the, if there's no, uh, what do you call it, the apostrophe, or like the dropping off, the other, if you see use, you're probably getting close to Sicilian territory. <laughs> this is awesome. Thank you so much. You, this is great. I appreciate it. Last. I appreciate you. Yeah. I appreciate all the work you do. I, I love your channel. So I've been watching for uh, probably over a year now. So basically around when you started. So that's a, I'm amazing. I, I don't know what I'm doing on the channel. Honestly, I'm just like, just if people want to come along for the weird thing that I'm working on, because this is just the stuff that like, you know, you like probably what you're doing is like, this is the stuff I just think about at home. I talk about mm -hmm. at home. I just wonder about and uh, it's just really beautiful to have these spaces to do that. Like, I think technology is just neutral. Like, I know some people really hate it, but I'm like, man, it's done a beautiful thing for me. And I know you feel the same way. I'm just yeah, connecting. Yeah. So. Connecting has been cool. And we're in a weird time. We're like, uh, we're, we're all trying to figure out like what it means to be in 2024 and, and what it means to yeah. keep a culture. All cultures are changing. Oh, thank, you. To thank you. Thank you. All right. Talk soon. Bye, Nick. <laughs>